Jurors won't hear about the nine-year-old girl that Stanley Ligon sexually abused one month before Jennifer Lewis was anally raped, strangled, doused with gasoline, and set on fire. They won't hear how he reached inside her swimsuit bottoms and touched her. They won't hear how she broke away and ran with him on her heels. And they certainly won't hear what her mother once testified. That after her child spoke in court against Liggins, he looked across the courtroom and told her he would kill her child. Here is the explanation Judge Marlita Grieve gave for not allowing jurors in the current trial to hear of this. Even highly probative evidence such as this previous crime may be excluded if the danger of unfair prejudice is too high. I simply cannot get over that part of this of this test. Um, I find that presenting this evidence to a jury who is hearing a case where a child was brutally sexually abused, strangled, her body dumped, set on fire, um, if they hear that that person sexually molested another child, they will certainly be enraged, disgusted, and prejudiced uh, against Mr. Liggins. I believe on that alone. In other words, a jury could convict Mr. Liggins on that basis alone, believing he's a child molester, and not necessarily on the evidence in this case or the lack of evidence in this case. So I am going to uh, deny the motion. This was a major setback for the prosecution. Scott County, Iowa prosecutor Mike Walton had argued. This issue is whether or not those convictions are, are probative. And the only, or one of the reasons perhaps these are different <clears throat> is because in the case where Mr. Liggins was convicted, the uh, little girl screamed and uh, ended the, the act, um, I, I, again, I, I don't, I guess you can go so far to say that the, the actual motions or the actual acts are different. I would argue that even attempting to molest or sexually assault a nine-year-old girl uh, is um, a fairly rare thing, and, and those are the similarities. And of course, in this case, we also get to the, if you want to talk about striking similarities, is the appearance of these two girls uh, to being very similar. So the evidence that a man would uh, sexually assault these nine-year-old girls, um, again, I believe has a great probative value in this type of case. Crimes aren't words on legal documents, or paragraphs in a judge's order. They are committed in a cruel world, and the suffering is real, and the anxiety is real, and the scars are lasting. The child Standing Liggins was convicted of sexually abusing is now a woman in her 30s. She has been following the trial and worrying. I'm sick. Anxiety through the roof. I, I've... A million and one things have been going through my head. My family's been trying to keep me um, home. And um, I'm just thinking of different scenarios that I need to take, whether it's sell my house and move out of state, um, get a better security system, hire somebody, um, definitely buy a gun. I'm scared to death of guns, but... I've been advised to maybe take that up. So, but I, I, I fear for my family. My, I mean, if something was to happen to me, my family has to deal with it. If something happens to my family because of something that happened to me back when I was a kid, it's so unfair. Here is how the crime was described on an earlier episode of Suspect Convictions. In 1990, the person who we are not identifying was living in Milan Manor apartments with her mom and sister. Their neighbor was Stanley Liggins' girlfriend. The victim still vividly remembers what happened on August 3, 1990. It was a hot day at the end of the summer. She and Stanley Liggins' girlfriend's daughter 
were outside playing in the water. She was wearing a large t-shirt over a bathing suit. She and her little friend took a break from running around and sat down on some steps to drink Kool-Aid. That's when she spilled some on her leg. She goes, go in and ask my dad for a wash rag. And um, I said, okay, you know, so I went in and went down the stairs, and their apartment was in the basement. And in the basement, it's the only apartment that's down there. And then there's one above it on the level that you have to come down. And um, so I went in there and asked him if I could get a wash rag. He said, yeah, have a seat. I sat at the kitchen table. And um, he went into the bathroom. He locked the door, went into the bathroom, grabbed the wash rag. And in between this, I think he unlocked the door because they had came in and then left. And then he locked the door and um, came back out with the wash rag and um, started washing my legs or my leg. And then he pulled my swimsuit over and tried to do it. Well, when he started to, I had um, stood up. And I, I don't know if there was a fear in me. So I was trying to think, oh, my gosh, how, how do I get out of this situation? And I want to say I punched him. And when I punched him, he's a big guy. I ended up. I don't know if the Lord was watching over me or what was going on, but I ended up knocking him off his balance, enough for me to get out of the kitchen to the door. I got the door unlocked, and um, as I was opening it, he was trying to close it. So I squeezed out the door, and then he ran after me. As I'm running up the stairs, I get to about the third, fourth stair up, And he started pulling my leg, telling me, don't tell your mom, don't tell your mom. And I'm trying to get my leg loose. So I finally broke free. And this whole time I'm screaming and it's echoing through this hallway and nobody comes out. And the first thing I could think of was um, Charlotte, one of my mom's friends, lived the, there's an apartment in between her and his apartment and I thought I didn't know anybody that lived in that one apartment and I thought it's going through my mind this is so close I got to get away from him you know and I didn't want to look back and see if he was following me so I just kept running and I ended up running to Charlotte's house and I my mom was home at the time but I just figured if I ran all the way down to my my apartment that he would get me before I got there so um I ran into Charlotte's and that's when I started telling her what had happened. And then she called my mom and my mom came over and we talked about it. I told her what had happened. And then um, the police were called and they came and took a statement. And that's when it all went down. The victim says jurors need to hear about her case because it represents a pattern of behavior. I don't want to go through it all over again. I've been through it once before. I live every day thinking about it. It's not something I want to do, but I want them to be aware of what what he did. But Judge Marlita Grieve questioned whether the two crimes were similar enough to be a pattern. And as I stated in my previous ruling, the acts against the previous child were not strikingly similar to the acts against Jennifer. There was no kidnapping, no anal penetration, no strangulation. The facts, as I understand, in that prior act was there was some touching on the child's thigh and towards her vagina or of her vagina. And I'm not sure about that, but that's, I think, the main part of that act. Further, the previous child ran into the apartment where Mr. Liggins was and wanted Cooley washed off her leg. So in other words, I thought that was a crime of opportunity, whereas Jennifer's sexual assault and her kidnapping, anal rape, strangulation, resulting in her death by being dumped and then burned. On Thursday, the prosecution presented its final witness, Jennifer's mother, Sherry Glenn McCormick. 
She gave a teary-eyed recitation of Jennifer's final day. I think Joe yelled at me and asked me if I had any gum. I said no. And then Jennifer comes in and asks me if she could go get a pack of gum for Stanley because he told her she could keep the change. What did she have in her hand? A dollar. Well, she wasn't allowed to go very far, so she could only go around the corner to Max Liquor Store, which was a little grocery store that st sold chips and gum and pop, candy bars. Do you know about what time this would have happened? That she'd left? Yes. I'd say maybe before or about 6.30. What did you do then? Well, because there were people there and I had to breastfeed Damien, so I got up and went to Jennifer's room to breastfeed her brother. And that was while Jennifer went to Max? Yes. This is State's Exhibit 67. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is that? That is Max. Max Liquor Store. That's where Jennifer went to go get the gum? Yes, it is. Do you recall how Jennifer left the house that to go to Max? She walked. And do you know what route she took? If she wasn't going to the front door and around the corner, she would cut through her backyard, through the wooded area, and cross, across the old parking lot of the gas station or recycling center, and then cross to go to the Max Liquors. How long did it take to get there? Not, but not even f maybe five minutes over there, five minutes back. If even that, unless she talked to somebody. I came out and it was the street lights came on and Jennifer knew she was supposed to be home by dark and she wasn't home yet. And I asked Joe where was Jennifer and he said she'd never come back from getting the gum. And Stanley was supposed to still be on the front porch. Did you look on the front porch? But he was gone. So the only person left was Joe? Joe, Joe and Damien. And the street lights were on? The street lights were on. It was dark. She needed to be home before dark. And no Jennifer? And no Jennifer. What'd you do? I started making phone calls. Maybe somebody knew where she was at or seen her. Maybe she was playing with a friend. And then I decided to take a walk and to go look for her. I called Charlene at the store and she said that she'd already been in there and had to get the gum for her mom's friend. Marie and get it home. Sherry continued the story of searching the neighborhood, making frantic phone calls, and eventually calling the police. The story, of course, ended where no parent wants to go. Did you ever see Jennifer again? No, I didn't. Did you do anything to believe that that little girl was her? Did I do anything, excuse me? Did you do anything to convince yourself that the little girl was her? I didn't want to convince myself it was her. I didn't want to believe it was her. Did you go anywhere to make it? Yes, they took me to the morgue. <laughs> they wouldn't let me go in there and hold her. Tell her goodbye. I only could tell it was her by her teeth. Judge Greaves sent the jurors home, and defense attorney Aaron Haubacher continued to question Jennifer's mother with the jury no longer present in the courtroom. At issue is a police report an Iowa appellate court found the prosecution had withheld from the defense during the first two trials. The report alleges that Jennifer's stepfather, Joseph Glenn, told someone he was selling cocaine to that he would like to photograph himself performing specific sexual acts with his wife and Jennifer. You recall uh, uh, Ace uh, stating that he would like to uh, videotape you and he, I'm going to be indelicate here because these are the words that were used. Uh, butt fucking? Nothing, no. And in that same conversation, did he uh, mention videotaping uh, and butt fucking Jim? No. That would have never been said. Since Jennifer was annually penetrated the day of the murder, the defense is seeking to have the report admitted into evidence as a means of pointing to an alternate suspect, Joseph Glenn. Folks, if you're anything like me, the word style kind of makes you uncomfortable. At least it does for me. I think of fancy models walking down runways, wearing clothes that I would never be caught dead in. It's something, you know, that I just don't do. I like clothes that are comfortable. 
and fit well and are attractive. And that's why I really like this company called Stitch Fix. Stitch Fix is an online personal styling service that finds and delivers clothes, shoes, and accessories to fit your body, budget, and lifestyle. Just go to stitchfix.com slash suspect and tell them your sizes, what styles you like, and how much you want to spend on each item. You'll be paired with your very own personal stylist who will pick five items to send you right to your door. Then you'll try them on, pay only for what you love, and return the rest. Shipping exchanges and returns are always free. There's no subscription required. You can sign up to receive scheduled shipments or get your fix whenever you want. Stitch Fix styling fee is only $20, which is applied toward anything you keep from your first shipment. Get started now at stitchfix.com suspect. You'll get an extra 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's stitchfix.com suspect to get started today. One more time, folks. You'll absolutely love this company. Go to stitchfix.com suspect. It's wonderful. You'll love it. I sure do. I'm Benjamin Payne, a reporter with WVIK Quad Cities NPR. I'm speaking with Scott Reeder, who is in Waterloo, Iowa, to cover the murder retrial of Stanley Liggins. Now, Scott, I understand the prosecution rested its case today. Can you tell me what that was all about? Well, basically, for all intents and purposes, the prosecution had presented their last witness to the case. Um, they hoped to present some more witnesses, um, but they filed a motion with the judge um, today for the jurors to consider a pattern of behavior. When Stanley Liggins was arrested in this crime, he was out on bond for sexually abusing another nine-year-old girl. In this case, it was a Milan girl. And um, if you look at two pictures of these uh, of Jennifer and of uh, this girl, they look remarkably similar. And in this case, he was accused of, well, I mean, I shouldn't say he was accused of, he was convicted of um, reaching under her swimsuit and uh, touching her vaginal area. And she broke away and ran, and he chased her, and um, but she escaped. And the uh, then a month later... Jennifer Lewis was sexually assaulted and um, strangled and killed. And the question before the judge is, A, are these sufficiently similar to be considered to be a pattern of behavior? And also, would the knowledge that Stanley Liggins had been convicted of child abuse, sexually abusing a child be so prejudicial, so overwhelming to jurors that they would lose sight of the case in front of them and just convict him because of things he's done in the past. And she said ultimately that she thought that if they told the jurors that this man was a, was a child molester, that they would lose sight of everything else and just convict him for that, if nothing else. So the, the jurors would not be able to consider this. I understand that um, Jennifer Lewis's mother came in to testify. Yeah, that was really heart rendering. I mean, it was just, you know, the poor woman. I mean, she's been through so much over the last 28 years. She talked about going into the morgue and they wouldn't let her hold her baby. You know, it was so badly burned. They talked about, you know, frantically searching in a Rock Island neighborhood for for Jennifer and not finding her. They talked about a lot of things. She talked about a lot of these things and they would flash up pictures on the, on the wall. And one of them was of Jennifer's bicycle. And she said, and he said, what is, what is this? And she goes, that's Jennifer's bike. And she was, she loved it so much. And she starts crying and, you know, everybody in that room, I think was very touched by, by, you know, what this woman was going through. And has been gone through for the last 28 years. Was there anyone else who testified? The only person that testified today was um, uh, Sherry Glenn McCormick. And then they spent the afternoon um, with the jury um, re released, um, arguing over um, 
uh, motions and whether uh, the jurors should hear about this prior, these prior bad acts of the defendant and scheduling um, for the remainder of the trial. And so the defense is going to bring in their witnesses to the stand beginning Friday. Do you have any idea who they might begin with? I don't. Um, I haven't seen the list. They're going to st- start with, I think, four witnesses who have died. So they're going to read in their prior testimony from past trials or depositions. And uh, usually that involves bringing in an actor to uh, do the reading. Then on Monday, I'm l- expecting, um, you know, live um, individuals to be testifying. I mean, uh, about what they think. Uh, I think one of the uh, people that's going to be interesting to hear from is um, Jennifer had two brothers. One was a baby when she died, and another one was about a year younger than her. And he's now serving time in Fort Madison uh, Penitentiary for a sex offense. And apparently he's going to be brought up to testify about something uh, that he heard when he was a child uh, growing up or something along those lines. It's interesting to note that the period where he would have lived with Jennifer last, he would have been three years old and uh, she would have been four years old. And then he ended up living with his biological father. So I don't know how much you can remember from when you were three years old and how much a four-year-old can articulate to a three-year-old that would be memorable that for you to testify about. So we'll, we'll find out what he's going to say, though. That should be interesting. Is there anything else you wanted to mention? No, that's the big stuff. Okay. Well, thank you, Scott, for joining me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Welcome to Death's Door Podcast, a podcast that explores the most haunting cases from America's death row. I'm Dominique, an attorney with a background in criminal law. And I'm Charlie. I'm joining Death's Door in Season 2 to bring the layman's point of view and ask the questions you're thinking of. Every other week, we're going to explore cases of the innocent and guilty, the executed and the exonerated. All of whom have one thing in common— They all know what it looks like to look through the bars of death row. We'll explore each case from its beginning to its conclusion. And that includes evidence, corruption, characters, and of course, the crime itself. We will also do shows giving you weekly updates on what's going on with the death penalty around the country. So join us weekly as we explore cases and updates. And in the meantime, stay safe and hold your loved ones tight.